Well, hello, Go Away Fest. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I am Aaron Schlesinger. Uh, I am here to talk to you today about Go modules. So uh, before we get started, you can see my uh, Twitter handle there, uh, AR Schles, and also there is a link down at the bottom of this slide to these slides as well as all of the demo and demo code that I will be showing today. So that's cda.ms slash 1mh. Uh, so feel free to bookmark that. You can always go back to it uh, later on and see everything we did, including instructions, code, and everything else. So let's get started. So I want to start this talk about the journey that we all took in the community to get from the beginning of Go all the way to here, where we are now at Go 113 and going to be going to Go 114 soon, uh, as well as most importantly for today, uh, dependency management with Go modules. So we started with nothing. We started with no dependency management in Go. And that was by design. The creators of Go decided that they would like to see use cases for dependency management in order to get a solution right. All right, so this was over 10 years ago now, and we've taken quite a journey from nothing uh, all the way up to now. So the first uh, sort of instantiation of dependencies was the GoGet tool. Okay, so GoGet was a huge step forward, but it still lacked a few things. Uh, the biggest thing was it lacked versions for uh, each project. So what I mean by that is if you do a go get, it will pull down the package you specify at the very latest version on the master or main branch, the default branch, okay? And that version will be shared across all of the projects on your machine. And that was in the days where we used GoPath, right? So you'll see uh, in a little bit in one of the demos that we are no longer relying on GoPath but of course we've had GoPath for quite a long time. And if your project was relying on version one and you did go get, you upgraded the dependency and you potentially would be okay for project two on your machine. But project one then would be using newer code that it probably did not expect to be using. Okay, so that was the first instantiation of dependency management with Go. The second instantiation was an extension of GoGet, and that was the vendor directory that came out in Go 1.5. So the vendor directory made a step towards project-specific versions, okay? So what this meant was you can put your own miniature GoPath inside of a vendor directory inside of your project's repository. And then that project would have the specific version that it needed of any package, and it would be locked in that project. So no other project could interfere with the dependencies that your project needs. Okay, so if project one needs module package A and project two needs package B, they won't conflict with each other, even if someone runs a go get on the machine later on, okay? And then we got tools to manage the vendor directories on your machine. So there were quite a few tools. I listed two here that were some of the more popular ones. You might be familiar with DEP, and DEP was a what was called an official experiment that was meant to uh, put a tool out into the community and see how the community reacted and more importantly, how the community used the specific features in that tool in the DEP tool. And DEP was informed by the designs that Glide and other tools introduced, okay? So now we're at the complete solution, the de facto standard, which is going all the way back to Go Get. Okay, so Glide and DEP and the vendor experiment and even the original Go Get were used to inform this design of the current Go Get. But in other ways, Go Get is new. It has some new features that have not been seen yet in the Go community. Okay, so let's dive into that. So as I mentioned, GoGet is new and it is the standard, okay? 
So it's really easy to go back and try to figure out what go get is doing or go build or go install or other commands. It's really easy to go back and refer to how these commands used to work before modules. Okay, so it's really important to remember fundamentally that go get and friends are new and they're doing a lot of new things under the hood behind the scenes. Okay, and if you find yourself trying to pick up another tool to augment GoGet or to do things that you think GoGet is not doing for you, try to remember that it is the standard now for Go dependency management, okay? So hopefully you can fit your workflow and your project into the new workflow that GoGet introduced. And if it's not now, then it hopefully you'll be able to do it over time, okay? So with that, I just want to reintroduce myself and tell you sort of where I'm coming from. Okay, so I am Aaron. Uh, I am a core maintainer and a co-creator of the Athens project, which is very deeply involved with modules in the module ecosystem. Uh, and I am a developer advocate at Microsoft. I focus on uh, open source cloud native technologies, including Go. Okay, so let's continue. So I mentioned that GoGet is the standard, okay? So not only is GoGet the standard, at this point, Go should provide every dependency management tool that you need within the Go tool chain, all right? So I say everything uses Go, and the Go there, I'm referencing the tool, the command line tool, okay? So over time, you should be aiming to get your project over to Go modules, or you should be starting a new project using Go modules. And you know when you get there because you will be using the Go CLI, the Go command line tool exclusively to do all of your dependency management. Now that might be a long path, a long journey to get there, and that's what this talk is uh, about today. Um, but that is the goal. That is the goal at the end of the journey. Okay. So I mentioned the workflow. It's deceivingly familiar, as I mentioned earlier. So it's easy to go back and reference what GoGet used to do. And it's easy to go back and reference your old workflow as well. Okay, so just remember that you will probably have to change your workflow, especially if you have an existing code base. And even more especially if you have a code base that uses private code and private dependencies. Okay. And that gets even more important if you're working on a team, as many of us are. So what is Go doing behind the scenes now? How is it different than the old Go get and Go build and Go install and, and so on? Now, first of all, okay, this one is big. Go get used to go and do a git clone or to check out the code from your GitHub repository your internal Git server or your Mercurial server or your Bazaar VCS server or SVN or any of the others that it supports. Now it still supports those with the exact same implementation, but by default, it downloads code from an HTTP server that the Go team at Google hosts for all of us. Okay, that is a HTTP server that is hosted at proxy.golang.org. Okay, so that's important to remember that the code that you rely on now is not hosted directly by GitHub or your VCS server of choice. There is now an intermediary that Google hosts. Okay, right, so the bottom line there is you are not doing version control system downloads. You're not doing Git clone or, or similar. Okay, so the second thing here, sum.golang.org. So this is a similar Google Go team hosted server. This is the global checksum database. Okay, so what this means is if you want to add a new module dependency or a new module version dependency, okay, so if you're upload or updating a module version, your Go command line tool will now be asking sum.golang.org, it will be doing a HTTP request to verify that you are getting the same checksum for that module as the original author intended, 
Okay, so you will be getting the same code that was originally checked in to GitHub. So the very first version of the module. And this ensures that nobody modified the module code between you and GitHub. There was no intermediary, there was no middleman that was acting against your interests. Okay, so this makes this ensures that when you pick up a new module, no one has inserted code to, let's say, upload credit card numbers to their server or uh, uh, insert a vulnerability or anything else of the like. Okay, so it's important to remember that two pieces of information are being sent up to an intermediary HTTP server, a trusted intermediary HTTP server, whereas before that information was only requested on GitHub. It was only sent to GitHub once. Okay. So what these two additions mean to dependencies is that you need to be prepared for the change. Okay. I call it layers to preparedness because there are a few different discrete things and discrete steps that you can make in a specific order in order to get prepared for moving your project completely over to modules. Okay, so number one, tracking and securing dependencies. Now this is fairly simple and we'll see it in a demo, but what this essentially means is how do you keep track of the code that you depend on? You used to do this with Glide or Dep, and now there will be a new way to do this. And then also, how do you make sure that you're downloading the right code? Okay, number two, keeping track of where your code comes from. Okay, so tracking dependencies means what code do you need? Now, after you track the dependencies, you have to make sure that you know where the code is coming from because some of your code may not be coming from the Go, the Go team hosted server, the server at proxy.golang.org. So you need to be aware of where each module, where each dependency is coming from, okay? Now, you may not be using, relying completely on the proxy.golang.org server. We'll see a demo of that as well. So you need to be aware of where you have code that's coming from a location. You also need to know where that code is stored. Is it stored in a database? Is it stored on a version control system directly? Or is it stored somewhere else? And then finally, sort of what wraps all of these up into a single consideration, this is the most important consideration, is how do you handle private code? Okay, so private code will have a very specific way that it needs to be tracked, that needs to come from a specific place, and needs to be stored in a specific way. Okay, so we're gonna jump into a demo. This will be the first demo of three, and we are going to build a code base that only has public dependencies. It won't be relying on any private code. So this is gonna be a basic idea of how modules work for the simplest type of project for modules. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, in the same repository that I put a short link to, I'll put it at the end of this talk as well, uh, this repository has not only the slides, but the three demos. So I'm gonna scroll down here and I'm gonna click on basic dash public and we will see instructions on how to run this project, okay? So this is a very simple web application using the HTTP GIN framework. Um, that implementation detail is not so important. Uh, what is important is that we do have a dependency now on this HTTP framework, okay? So scrolling down here, we are going to run the demo, okay? So there are two commands that we're gonna run. We're gonna do a remove and we're gonna do a go run, okay? So the first command ensures that our local on disk cache of dependency code is no longer there. We have no cached code anymore. And we're only doing this to show that code is indeed being downloaded from proxy.golang.org. Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to copy that into my basic public directory. Okay, I'm going to clear the screen and I'm going to paste that command in, put in my password. And now we have no code cached on disk. So we will be now relying on the server, the Google hosted server. 
So going back to the instructions, I'm going to do a go run now. And da, 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 let me close this other window. Oops. I need to just, there we go. So now I can do my clear the cache. I had to reverse some of the uh, operations that I did for previous demos, so sorry about that. We are going to do our go run now. Uh-oh, and we'll do one more thing. So you'll see some of the inner workings here of how modules works. And it was a little earlier than I intended, um, but what we're seeing here is there is a go proxy environment variable that tells the modules system where to get modules. What HTTP server should we be getting modules from? So I'm gonna set up my go proxy to the Google proxy. Now you shouldn't have to do this in, uh, in the default case. I have to do this to override some previous operations that I did, but I am doing it here to be very explicit. Okay, so I'm saying the module system of my machine needs to be downloading module code from the Google hosted server. Okay, so now I'm gonna run and now we'll see some output. You can see that we are downloading, the Go tool is downloading a bunch of different dependencies for us. Okay, so you'll see the first one is Jin. That is my, uh, that is the web framework that I need to rely on. Then all the things below Jin are Jin's dependencies and the dependencies of those dependencies and so on. Those are called transitive dependencies. And then down here we see that my server is running. So before we test out the server, let's look at one thing. Let's look at how we're tracking these dependencies. So you'll see a go.mod and a go.sum file in all of the module enabled Go projects in the world. Okay, so go.mod is the important one to know about. Okay, so you see here that I have three dependencies that I rely on. Okay, so Jin, Helpers, and Plush. All right, so the, this is the list of things that I import in my code. Okay, and the go tool will help you figure out what these should be. Okay, and then the other file here, go.sum, is much longer, and you will almost never need to worry about this. But this is all of the dependencies that your project requires, including transitive dependencies, and the checksums for those dependencies. Okay, so let's check out the project really quick. We're gonna go to localhost port 8081, and we can see demo one, We've got the Go Away Fest uh, logo, and we can just look at some cats, pictures of cats, very cute. And we can look at some pictures of dogs as well, also very cute. Okay, so I'm gonna close that up, and we are going to go back to the slides. Okay, so the one thing I want you to think about here is that we no longer have a vendor folder, but all of the code we downloaded was from essentially a networked vendor folder, okay? That vendor folder is stored at the HTTP proxy.golang.org server. And that server is optimized to serve code out of the vendor folder very quickly and efficiently, okay? And if you set up your own server for modules, and you'll see that today, that will additionally be a highly optimized vendor folder with a highly optimized delivery system, HTTP and compression, and a highly optimized database to store those modules, okay? So let's move on to private code. So now I have a, a code base that is private and it relies on private dependencies. So what I don't want anymore is to request those dependencies, that code, from proxy.golang.org. I also don't want my Go tool to be checking checksums with sum.golang.org, okay? So going back to my original demo, every time the Go tool downloads one of these dependencies, it compares this checksum 
with sum.golang.org. Okay, so in other words, if you add a new dependency to your project, the first time you add it, the Go tool will calculate the dependency of the code that it downloads, and then it will send the code's name, the module name, and this dependency up to sum.golang.org, and it'll make sure that they match, okay? So we do not want that with private code for two reasons. One, we don't want to be sending the names of our private modules to an uncontrol a server that we don't control and don't know the inner workings of. And secondly, our build will fail anyway if we send that up because sum.golang.org and proxy.golang.org as well, they don't have access to our private code. That's by design, of course. All right. So let's go back to our GitHub repo. Let's check out how we do private code. It's going back to the top of the repository, clicking through to basic dash private. We're going to go down to our instructions. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is set in another environment variable called go private. Okay. Go private tells the module system on my machine to not request this module name from proxy.golang.org and also to not check the checksum of this module from go uh, from the sum.golang.org server. Okay. So we're going to do that right now. Let's go back up to basic.public. Uh, basic dash private is what I meant. Okay, let's clear the screen out and let's paste that command in. All right, so we've got go private set now. Going back to GitHub, we're going to tell the Go tool to ensure that we are downloading private code from the SSH GitHub endpoint instead of the HTTP GitHub endpoint. And that's a common Git operation, and you may have done that already with previous versions of the Go tool. So this is just necessary to make sure that I can download private code. All right, so let's paste that in as well and then go back to our instructions. We're going to do our familiar operation of deleting the cache. Put my password there. Okay, and now this is again going to force us to go back and download all of the dependencies we need. Okay, so before I run go run, what's going to happen here is we're going to download all of the public dependencies from proxy.golang.org. And we're going to skip the private dependency here. We're going to download that directly from GitHub because we have told the Go tool via this go private environment variable to not go up to proxy.golang.org and instead go directly to GitHub. Okay, so let's do this. And here we see downloading Jin and all the familiar ones. But we also see in here in the same log line downloading the private module. Okay, so this is being done against GitHub instead of against proxy.golang.org. We can prove that because we know that proxy.golang.org does not have my GitHub credentials, so it never could access this go uh, this GitHub repository to serve up that code. All right, so let's prove out that we can access our same server. Okay, it just says demo two now. We've got the great go day, uh, the go away fest logo. I love this logo. And now we can just make sure we see the same cats and dogs. Okay, so this is a very simple server. I just like pictures of cats and dogs pretty much. Okay, so let's close that up. Let's go back to our slides. All right, so um, we have basically just covered how we download our private code directly from GitHub, okay? But the one thing that we're missing out on is that we don't, we don't have that shared vendor directory that we used to have with proxy.golang.org, okay? So the shared vendor directory is valuable for two reasons. One is it's more efficient in many cases to download modules from the shared vendor directory, from the HTTP server, whether that HTTP server is proxy.golang.org or something else. We'll show something else in a second. All right, so it's more efficient to download from there than a version control system. The second thing is it separates out the developer workflow to update module dependencies on GitHub from delivering a static asset 
to app developers. So imagine you have a 1,000 person engineering team and you have a bunch of different dependencies, a bunch of different modules that are worked on by one team and a bunch of different applications that depend on those modules that are worked on by other teams. A, in, a, a intermediary HTTP server that serves up modules will insulate and decouple the development teams for the modules with the app development teams that rely on them. That's really important to make sure that the development teams for the modules don't accidentally update code that the app development teams didn't expect. All right, so let's go see how to add one of those servers into our private infrastructure and essentially own our own database of modules, of private modules, and, and in essence, own our own shared vendor directory as well. Okay. So we're gonna head back over to our repository. We're gonna go back up to the root of our repository. We're gonna click on Athens-Private. We are going to, oops, that's the wrong thing to click on. We're going to shut down our server. We're gonna head over to Athens-Private and we are going to read the script for this. All right, so I'm gonna run the Athens server via Docker. Okay, so the Athens server is the HTTP server that acts as the intermediary between me, the app developer, and the developer of this private repository. We're using the same private repository as last time. So Athens is going to be the server that efficiently downloads that private repository stores it, and then from that point on, serves it up efficiently to all of the clients, all of the dependents of that repository. In other words, the people who depend on that repository to build their app. All right, so I'm gonna use Docker to run Athens. It is now running on port 3000. And then I'm gonna head, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna head down, I'm going to tell the Go module system to use Athens, to use my running Athens server for all dependencies, including my public ones, okay? So Athens acts as the delivery service, not only for my private code, but also for all of my public code. Again, this is about controlling our own shared vendor directory, whether it's private code or public code. All right, so let me open up a new tab and I'm going to set up my Go proxy environment variable. I'm gonna set up my Go no sum DB environment variable, which again is the environment variable that tells my local Go tool chain to not access sum.golang.org for this repository. Again, this prevents me leaking this repository's name up to the hosted server that I don't control. All right, so that one as well. And now I'm going to unset the go private environment variable that I did in the last demo. This is not needed anymore. And then I'm gonna do the two familiar actions. I'm going to remove my cache and I'm going to do a go run. Now, if we head back over to the Athens running server, we see tons and tons and tons of logs. Now this is the Athens server fetching all of the modules that it needs to serve up to my build. It's not only fetching private code, it's also fetching public code. So no matter what happens to my upstream HTTP server to the proxy.golang.org or the upstream GitHub repository for my private code, it now will always be stored inside of Athens, inside of the Athens database. All right, so going back to my Go run, we see familiar output, the downloading output, and then we see the same server is now running. All right, so let's go to that server again, localhost 8081. We've got our demo three, and we've got our same dog and cat pictures. That's my favorite one right there. Dogs as well, okay, great. All right, so if you go to uh, this, co this demo code base later, you can see a bonus, and this is a really interesting one that I unfortunately cannot uh, show today. So I really encourage you to go check that out. All right, back to the slides. 
So those are the three demos. Those show off all the possible ways that you can safely access your private code and also own your own vendor directory and your own database of all the modules that all of your development teams need to build their applications with. Okay, so just to close out, I want you to really remember after this talk that we are talking about a fundamental change under the hood of the modules and dependency system inside of the Go tool. Okay. Second of all, we now have increased security, so authentication of modules using that checksum database. That's a really good thing for the fidelity of your application, but it can also be very difficult to manage when you are talking about private code. Okay, sorry about that. So, as I mentioned, there's higher complexity involved here. Third of all, I mentioned private code quite a bit here. It takes very, con very careful consideration to ensure that you are handling your private code correctly. It's a one-time setup essentially, but it takes a very careful consideration when you are migrating your existing apps over to modules. Okay, and it involves overwriting defaults. You saw me doing exports to change over default environment variables that the Go module system provides to you. You have to remember to change those defaults. So from this point, you've gotten a sort of an introduction to how to do all these things. There is more reading that you can do to get quite a bit more in depth on how those environment variables work, more generally how the module system works, and also there's a wiki on GitHub that provides really deep insights in the technical underlying details of modules. All right, so once again, uh, I wanna thank you so much for coming and watching. And I wanna make sure you remember, you can see slides and demo at this link. Uh, I talked about and showed Athens in action, and you can see more details about action here, about Athens here, excuse me. And that's docs.gomods.io. Uh, lots of reading in there about how Athens complements modules and how you can take advantage of it inside of your infrastructure. Uh, and my Twitter again. So I uh, encourage you to check out my Twitter as well. Uh, there's, there's announcements about Athens, announcements about modules, uh, and also more general information about Go. So thank you so much again for coming and uh, being here with me and listening to me about modules. Uh, and I hope you go forth and uh, convert your projects over and enjoy the new module system. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.